Welcome to the Holy Post. On today's show, is it time to end live streaming of worship services? And what about those who can't return to in-person worship? ABC has suspended Whoopi Goldberg for her comments about the Holocaust and race, causing us to ask the question, what does it mean to be Jewish? Then Stephen Colbert talked openly about his faith and vocation as a comedian, but did he go far enough? And David Brooks' new article in the New York Times causes us to ask, when is it okay to leave our churches or institutions, and when should we stay and try to repair them? Then I talked to history professor Robert Tracy McKenzie about his book, We the Fallen People, and how America's founders really didn't have that much faith in the American people or democracy. Here is episode 495. Hey there, welcome back to the show. This is Phil Vischer. This is Holy Post Podcast. I am here with Caitlin Shess. Hi, Caitlin. Hi, Phil. And Sky Jatani. Hi, Sky. Hey, everyone. Or should we call you Heaven Jatani? <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> we just learned that Sky's name in, well, Sky in Spanish is also the Spanish word for heaven. So I think yeah. that's it's, almost your name. It's the same in Greek and Hebrew also. Like when they refer to that's the heavens, right. they mean the sky. Why did we change it? Why did we break it apart in English? That's a good question. I don't know. Who do we ask? Who uh, would know? Probably Google. You think so? <laughs> yeah. You, you have a lot of confidence in Google. Yeah, the uh, etymology of, of sky and heaven would not be hard to find on Google. Jason Rugg is here also. Jason, one question. Have you walked yet today? I did, actually. Yeah. You did? Good <laughs> job. How far? Yeah. Uh, three and a half miles. Wow. That's yeah. good. It's, it's in the 20s, so it's not too bad. No, no. It was it was starting to snow a little bit towards the end, so that wasn't oh. as fun. But uh, yeah. Oh, but did you have a hat on, so it was okay? I did. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's <laughs> and I had good. to fix my hat hair before this. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and now it's time for the theme song. What's the news that you like the most? Who's your favorite podcast host? If it's breakfast, get your toast. It's Sky and Phil and the Holy Post. Sky and Phil and the Holy Post. And sometimes Caitlin. Okay, I have a lot of stuff to talk about. So, uh, Caitlin, I apologize in advance. I do not have time for anything but related or anything that you might otherwise find disagreeable. I just oh, don't have great. I just don't have time. I just don't <laughs> have time. And that's I think I think people are becoming we've we've worried about polarization in America. You know, America's mm-hmm. becoming polarized. I think people are becoming polarized over news of the butt. Is it because it seems to be fewer and I, fewer people in the middle. I think that might be appropriate in this case. And there are either people that are, I have like half of the audience is saying, hey, you know, you could do that less. And the other half yeah. of the audience is sending me butt news, you know, via email, Twitter, Facebook. <laughs> so we've had some people say they would share our show more with yeah, friends, family, whatever, if it didn't have news I on know. the butt. And that this hurts is an evangelistic heart. opportunity that you're missing. It hurts my heart. To think, because then your friends are going to think, oh, these Christians sound reasonable, but where's their sense of humor? Where's their levity? Where's their ability to look at the world and find the ridiculousness? Yeah, and that's, what, didn't Paul butt. say he became all things to all people that he yeah. might win? Okay, okay. So, yes. like, we can be there... ridiculous without butt news. What? Mm. How? I, I don't know. Oh, some more, some see, animal you got news. Nothing. You, you could got tell nothing. weird stories that are not butt news, and I would be happy. Would you? I would. I, I promise. I think you'd be happy on the outside, but I think you'd be crying a little bit on the inside. No, just I'm, a little bit on the inside. I'm okay with ridiculous, Phil. I just. But your mom would be disappointed. Your mom would my, be disappointed, wouldn't my she? My mom would be thrilled if there was oh, never no. butt news ever again. Oh, <laughs> I doubt that. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of uh, saying things online or on TV or on social media that create a bit of a hubbub, uh, a couple of things happened in this last week. Tish Harrison Warren wrote a piece in the New York Times that kind of got some pushback. Although well, maybe that was week before last, but we didn't talk about it last week. She wrote a piece saying, basically, it's time for churches to stop streaming their services and let's all go get back to church. It's kind of what it said, right? You saw that? Right, yeah. Yeah, and there was some blowback. There was some uh, significant, some people got hot about it, 
primarily saying, you know, if you're disabled, if you're immunocompromised, you can't go back to church yet. So don't turn off the live streams. We need the live streams. It makes church accessible. Her point was, and this is this is what she, um, this is what she what she said. We seek to worship holy with heart, soul, mind, and strength, and embodiment is an irreducible part of that wholeness. I think people worshiping online is a diminishment if they could be in person. Um, and does anyone want to disagree with that? I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> I was, uh, okay, then I'm going to I'm going to give her article. I'm going to give your position. Sky says okay. that's dumb. Says Sky. Oh. Okay, Caitlin, do you disagree what? with that? <laughs> yeah. See, you're going to have to listen to the show when it's done to see what I said. You said because you don't yeah, know I am. what I just said. You said, Caitlin, do you? Uh, generally agree with Tish Harrison Warren? Yes. Uh, well, okay. Can I, can I not totally answer your question and say something else instead? Yeah. It will. Sky just did. So <laughs> okay. yeah. Cool. I, well, I think, I think there was a good amount of criticism online that said something important, which was to say, you said this thing pretty harshly and universalistically, and there are situations in which this might not be the right response. And I think that was really yeah. like robustly described by people. Yes. I think, I think two of the things that was that were missed in this conversation were one, the way in which having an online option available, while it could be good and under certain circumstances might be necessary, doesn't just add one option to all sorts of other things. Sometimes it actually forecloses other good options. And what I mean by that is if you have people in your community that have reasons why they cannot be with you physically, it's a lot easier to say, let's do an online version. You go watch the streaming version. Instead of we're going to put the money in our budget to build a ramp for your wheelchair to get you up to the door, mm -hmm, or mm -hmm. we're going to have a team of people that come and bring you communion in your home if that's safe for you, or we're right. going to find creative solutions, or we're going to, maybe you have sensory issues. Someone was tweeting about that. It wasn't an immunocompromised thing. It was a sensory issue and a disability. We're going to lower the music because one person in our congregation who can't participate physically is important enough to us that we need to kind of make some creative changes. I, I, I think online options can be really good, but I do think sometimes people in the conversation online missed the way in which it can be an easy way for us to actually avoid serving the marginalized people in our congregations because so many people online were saying, hey, I think the online option is important for me right now, but I agree with Tish that in, in person would be better, that embodied mm -hmm. worship is important. It's just about accessibility. And I do think sometimes because the online option was the only option at the beginning of COVID, we lost the sense of creativity to meet people for other in other ways. Right, right. And the second thing about this that I think is really important is the difficult thing about writing cultural commentary on a really broad scale, like what Tish is doing, and lots of people do and is important and good, is that you're making one kind of proclamation that might be good in certain contexts and might not be good in other contexts. And I think this is one of those instances where Pastors and churches need to have teams of people, some with medical backgrounds, some who are either disabled or have a special attention to disability, to be involved in conversations about what's right for specific churches. And I think what a lot of people did online was say, hey, your prescription doesn't match my context. And that's important and true. And it's one of those tricky things about anytime we say anything online, maybe in her community, there's really high vaccination rates. And the bigger problem is people choosing to not come in person because they've just gotten comfortable and they do need something to push them to be in person. In another community, that's not the issue. In another community, it's that people with that are immunocompromised or with disabilities need access. And so I think one of the hard things is, is recognizing that there's not going to be a one size fits all prescription when it comes to things like this. That's for sure. Sky, Sky, that was a good answer. It was a very good answer. <laughs> that and was a way better answer than, I'm sorry, I wasn't listening. But, <laughs> hey, at least I told the truth. That's good. Can, can, I, can I add a, a layer to this whole thing? Yeah, uh, I'm sorry, I, I wasn't listening. Uh-huh. What? Uh, yes, what's your layer? <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I understand the debate between those who are able to gather presently physically in worship and those who are not able to for various reasons and, and having compassion and understanding. And, and that was kind of the essence of the pushback. But I think what people are missing is that there's a, there's a fundamental disagreement on the purpose of Sunday morning or the church in general that I think we need to uncover here. So here's what I mean. Mm. For most of Christian history and in most Christian traditions, it was understood that, and I've done a video about this some years ago, Jason helped me with it. It was understood that the worship service was a vehicle. It was 
intended to transport people together, but transport them into communion with God. And the way that that happened was through the word, through prayer, and through sacrament. And the people who couldn't be there because they were sick or they were um, infirm or whatever reason they couldn't be there, there was accommodation made. And I remember doing this when I was a hospital chaplain. You would bring the word, prayer, and sacrament to where they were, a hospital room, a home, wherever. And so though they couldn't be there in person, you, you could still have that communion with God through the presence of the church in these ways. One metaphor to think about it is when we gather together on Sunday, it's like we're all getting on a bus together and we're all going somewhere together. And for those who couldn't be on that bus, they can still join us because we can send a cab for them or they can drive individually in a separate vehicle like that. But it's still about the the destination is communion with God. Mm -hmm. And I think what people are reacting to is that in recent years, and especially in more evangelical traditions of the church, the church is no longer viewed as a vehicle. It's viewed as a destination in itself. And so it once you believe that the the whole goal is to be on the bus or the whole goal is to... Right, because um, they, they got a great show on that bus. Exactly. I mean, the metaphor I use in the video was the difference between an ocean liner and a cruise ship. Yeah. An ocean liner was supposed to transport you, you know, from New York to London, or and the ship was just the means by which you get there. And that's how the church used to function. And now churches are cruise ships, where the goal is actually to be on the ship. It's not about where the ship is the, taking because you. Because of the buffet and the water slide. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But once you believe that the, the goal is the event itself, then if you can't be there, there's no substitute. Because the, the event is the preaching and the event is the music and you can't recreate that for somebody who's homebound or hospital, you know, stuck in the hospital. So the church as a destination, which is the dominant model in most of evangelicalism, the only way those people can engage it is through streaming online, yeah. you know, video. And if you take away that option, you're taking away church entirely. And I think what, what Tish Harrison Warren's article uh, betrays a little bit is her assumption, I think, is the church is a vehicle. And for the people who can't actually attend the gathering on Sunday morning, it's okay because we need to send ministers and caretakers to them with communion and to read God's word and to pray with them, which is what's supposed to happen on Sunday. And she's neglecting the fact that for a lot of people, it's not about communion with God, to put it harshly, it's about the event. And that can't be outsourced, that can't be uh, mobilized in the way that sacrament and prayer and the word can be. So I think that's one of the fundamental breakdowns here is we, we just have a modern understanding of church as a destination that doesn't lend itself to not being physically present or at least streaming it online. But and still, that, there, still there's the notion of just being together. Yeah. It's, it's not simply because the show is better if you're in person than if you're watching a bootleg VHS copy of the show. Yeah, later. but the fact is, most of us in our gatherings on Sunday morning are the primary function of that gathering is not community. Yeah, that typically happens in a class or a small right. group or right. something like that. And um, yeah, so I I think the discussion is really fascinating. This is the discussion that the 21st century church needs to be having, which is around physicality and embodiment versus disembodiment and digitalization of the of yeah. I mean, this is a great, complicated discussion. I'm glad people are having it, but we also need to ad identify our underlying assumption about the whole purpose of Sunday morning, which we're not really talking about. Mm. Oh, well, you are, Sky. You I am. You've been making videos about that for years now. Mm -hmm. So, so that's good. Okay, okay. So, Tish, hey, oh, you want to say something, Caitlin? I see well, that I hand. <laughs> Thanks, Phil. I was just going to say that I think the other thing that's important to get out of this, because it's easy to get into the mindset of like, this is this debate that's happened. I mean, I did this last week when it was on Twitter. <laughs> I didn't tweet anything because I was like, so much was happening, you know, yeah. but I did get way into the weeds of like, who's saying what and what's, you know, and it was helpful with some distance like a week later to spend some time today thinking about because this this week in her newsletter, Tish put a bunch of responses that people gave. She like mm. included long quotations from people who were critical, some people who were you know positive about what she said. Um, but I was thinking today, like I do think of all of the things we could learn from this. One really important thing is the passion with which people responded to this, which would be easy to attribute to anger online. And I do think there was a little bit of that. But I do think a lot of it is large portions of the church, especially disabled, immunocompromised people 
having spent maybe their entire lives feeling pretty disconnected to local churches because not just because of lack of online options, like I said, there's all these other creative ways we could be responding to this, but because people were just unaware, like people in churches were not paying attention to the fact that a child with sensory issues was not going to thrive in children's ministry the way that we had formulated it, or the fact that an adult with a physical disability needed the church to be constructed in a different kind of way for it to be truly accessible to them. And I think this is a good opportunity for people who don't feel those kinds of barriers to church to listen and to empathize with people who the passion that they were expressing their opinions online this week was really coming from a place of desperation and hurt for the church continuing to ignore them and then especially feeling like their one chance at being included during the pandemic was being, you know, criticized online. And again, regardless of all of the different options of how we could think about online church, I think one thing is just to really pay attention in our own specific local churches to the needs of specific people in our church and what we could do, including, I think, especially including in-person solutions, things like changing the layout of the building or the music to make it really accessible for people to hear that and what people's criticisms were online. Yeah, I think one of the blessings of this debate and conversation, blessings or this uncomfortable things, is unfortunately in churches that put effectiveness and growth as their primary values, the chronically ill are an afterthought, yes. if they're thought of at all. Right. And that right. has to change. And it's it's an indictment of these business-minded, market-driven values that govern too much of what ministries do. Right. Okay. Well, and you can't be that big and know the needs of the people in your church. At right. a certain point, you just won't know that people aren't showing up because your building is not accessible to them. Right. Okay. So we're, yeah, we're yes. And we see the, her point and we also see the other points and it's kind of, it's, it's not black or white. Is that what we're saying? It's kind of gray. It's in the middle. Mm -hmm. It's both and. That's tricky. Okay. I got to move on. We got, this one's short. This one's short. Now that next hubbub, next hubbub, uh, Whoopi Goldberg. Whoopi Goldberg made a hubbub last week. Did you hear? Did you follow this guy? Uh, a little bit. Yeah, yeah. They were talking about you know the the cancellation of or the the banning of the book Moss, the German you know the. the uh, isn't it book. Mouse? Moss. It's M A U S. How do you yeah, say but that? Isn't in it German? pronounced Mouse? I don't know. How do you say that in German? Because it's because it's about mice. I know, but it's German. <laughs> How do you say Mouse in German? Moss. <laughs> I don't know. Balls. Anyway, the book was banned because it's about the Holocaust, and we don't want our kids learning about the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. That's scary. And supposedly it had some bad words in it. I too. think it had the word damn yeah. in it. Yeah. See, we yeah. can't have kids learning that there's a word called, well, I'm not even going to say it. I can't because, even say that. Because the word damn is worse than the murder of six million people. Yeah. 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 Oh, um, my gosh. Oh, <laughs> I need that sound and just to take it around with me and play it for people. <laughs> oh, my. oh my gosh. Oh. Um, so what was I talking about? Oh, Whoopi Goldberg was talking about it on The View and she said, you know, unwisely said the Holocaust wasn't about race. It was about man's ability to treat other men, you know, inhumanely um, because it was two groups of white people. You know, it was one group mm -hmm. of white people killing another group of white people and boom, smash, explosion. Everybody went crazy. She was anti-Semitic. She was, it was all, and then um, ABC ended up uh, suspending her for two weeks. She was, uh, she suspended from the view for two weeks mm -hmm. so she can learn what she's done and, uh, and repent of her sins. Okay. Thoughts? Ah. Uh. Okay, should I go first? <laughs> <laughs> go for it, um, Phil. Race is a social construct. There is no such thing as race, technically. Uh, so, you know, but it is a social construct. And now we would say, quite often we would say today that most of the Jewish people we know, we would classify as white in America. That's typically how we look at people. That is not how we looked at people in Europe in uh, the first half of the 20th century, uh, particularly how the Nazis looked at people who were, we know, trying to create a master race and who found Jewish people an impure race that needed to be moved aside, gotten rid of. So... Uh, so I read one piece that and it was, and this was in the Israeli, uh, the Israel Times talking about it. And, you know, it was just an opinion piece that said, yes, she's wrong and she's right. 
she's right in that, you know, are we of race? Are we in ethnicity? Anyone can convert and be Jewish. We're a religious group. Uh, so one of the pieces I, I uh, read just concluded that the best way to view Jews is as a family. You know, it's not, it's, it's more than an ethnic group. It's more than a religion. It's a family and you don't have to be religious to be in the family and you don't have to be ethnically Jewish to be in the family. So in that sense, Whoopi was kind of right, but she was wrong in that there weren't racial issues at play at the time. Right. There seems to be two different issues here, though. There is what she said and whether yeah. it was right or wrong and how do you define what's what does it mean to be Jewish. But then there's the reaction to what she said. Yeah. And was the reaction the right way to respond to this? And um, I totally agree with you, Phil. Like What she said, I think, was an error and, and a false understanding of World War II and the motivation of the Nazis, for sure. Um, but the response to her seems really weird. It's... It's more evidence that secular America is behaving an awful lot like a religious fundamentalist group. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a puritanical, you have violated some speech code, and the only option is excommunication. It's it's that cancel culture Tem kind of- Temporary excommunication. Temporary in this case, but still, it's it's like our only way to express disagreement with someone is some kind of harsh- visible professional punishment. And right, right. it's like a one size fits all kind of thing. And I, I think what would have been far more interesting is I didn't see the episode, but I'm assuming some of the co-hosts she was with disagreed with her. I would assume. Um, but what would have been more interesting is to have someone come on the show to do exactly what you just did, Phil, which is an expert to talk about, not that you're an expert in this, but to bring on an expert to say, here are the multifaceted realities of what it means to be Jewish. Here's how it was understood by the Nazis in the early 20th century and have Whoopi Goldberg learn something along with the rest of us about what at times can be a complicated or misunderstood reality. Like right. that would have been an edifying appropriate way to do it rather than just you must be shamed, you must be you must apologize and you must disappear for a while. Yeah, in interestingly, even some of the Jewish groups that criticized her came out and said, "Well, we don't think she needs to be suspended for for 2 weeks. We don't think you that you know that that's an overreaction." And it, it probably is a case of ABC as a network being so concerned about a label of anti-semitism or a label of racism, you know, getting stuck right. to one of their personalities that like, oh, what do we have to do? Chop off their hand? Should we, if we chop off their hand, will everything be okay? And then we can go back to making money. Uh, so there's yeah. like, some hyper kind of fundamentalist vigilance going Which on. Which makes on me side. wonder, what would the reaction have been? I don't know who the hosts are right now of The View, but they usually have a conservative, a white conservative. There's on there. usually one. <laughs> Yeah. And right. then they, they get so worn out and beaten up that they quit and then they have to find a new one. So what would the reaction have been if that person had made this comment rather than Whoopi Goldberg? I don't know. I'm going to say different, but I'm not exactly sure how. Right. Yeah, it would have been worse, actually, because that's just an example of, you know, of conservatives being ignorant. Right. Or so, in line with a long lineage of white supremacy that also dismissed you know, a anti-Semitism is yep. a non-issue, yep. right? Yep, 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 yep. Mm -hmm. uh, Caitlin's thought. I think I think the other thing here is the weird way in which, and I get that it's a talk show and this is literally what they do. Also, we kind of ironically do that, but I don't think mm -hmm. in quite the same way. It's bizarre to me that people just talk so often about things that they have no mm -hmm. background or like expertise or like right. it's That's one what thing. I'm doing right now. Yeah, well, Caitlin. okay. It's sometimes a little bit that, but... Sometimes it's not. You have yeah. a lot of evangelical culture expertise. I have some cred. And yeah. But truly, like the, the fact that people can have such positions of, of influence and power over people mm -hmm. and can then choose to use them to just say whatever they think about stuff that they don't know anything about mm -hmm. is a prior problem with how we think about celebrity. Like the fact that you became a celebrity because you're an actress or you play a sport and then we feel like that makes you qualified to talk about anything that you have no background yep. in is like a weird a weird byproduct of celebrity culture that probably needs to die. And it happens all sorts of times where no one gets slapped on the wrist, but instead their influence leads people astray on all sorts of things because they don't know what they're talking about. Joe, Joe Rogan? 
I feel like the popular mm. culture is becoming like a protracted um, episode of Wipeout. You know, that show where they have to yeah, run yeah. through like the obstacle course. <laughs> yeah. And so there's like, oh. all these public personalities, yeah. especially yeah. And, entertainers. And 90% of the time you end up in the water upside yeah. down. And, and But people are actually, I think, entertained now by watching. By the wipeouts. Yeah. Oh, look, they brought up a Jewish topic. Let's see who's going to misspeak. Yes. Oh, yeah. the so-and-so <laughs> said, use the wrong pronoun here and they're going to get wiped out. And like it, it's like a gauntlet that people are walking through now if you're a public figure. It's and like, there's it's zero like the grace. arena. It's like the Coliseum. It's yeah. like, let's throw Whoopi in the Coliseum against, you know, a conservative and then have them talk about race and see who gets taken down first. Right. But it's it's Exciting. also the secular it's also secular people who are cheering this on in, in the way that religious yeah. communities used to do this, puritanical and, communities used to do this. And how do we sum it all up at the end of the day? Are you not entertained? <laughs> right. Exactly. That. Is what we're going for. Okay, okay, so that was that. Next one, next hubbub, hubbub, Stephen Colbert last week. Stephen Colbert, if you saw this, I think just about everybody saw this. If you haven't, you should Google it. Um, got interviewed, got his interview turned around by Dua Lupe. Is that a Dua Lupo? Dua no. Dua Lupe? No. <laughs> a singer with a Dua name. Lipa. <laughs> Dua Lipa? Dua Lipa? Is that what it is? Yeah, as far as I know, I'm pretty sure. What sounds like a command that's given to a ballerina. Yeah, well, I think it's it's those bigger Legos for little kids. Go play with your Dua Lipe's. This is not nice. <laughs> Let's see, which one of us goes down first? You Say something else, guy. <laughs> say something else about Dua Lipe's name. No, hey, no. I got a funny name. <laughs> Heaven is not a funny name, Sky. It's beautiful. That's not my name. Okay, so, uh, oh, as Julie says, her name means love. Oh, That's now so I nice, feel... That's so nice, and you made fun of it. Wait, I didn't, in what language? <laughs> Not Spanish. In which part? Dua <laughs> yeah. or Lipa? Okay. okay. <laughs> so she turned the interview around on Stephen Colbert and asked him to comment, said, what, you're a person of faith. I appreciate that you talk about your faith. How does your humor interact with your faith? And does one ever win over the other? And Stephen Colbert then talked, we believe, extemporaneously for about two minutes, which included insightful quotes from famous people um, and just said something beautiful about, you know, that ultimately, <laughs> because we're mortal, faith always wins. At the end, faith always wins. And he hopes humor. that Jesus has a sense of humor. And he hopes that Jesus has a sense of humor. Um, Agreed. Yeah, but that humor is partly acknowledging that death isn't the end that so we don't have to be afraid and you know and the quote was about how fear uh sometimes fear of evil we use to justify picking up evil devices you know to to face our fear to face the evil and that we must resist that and it was a very insightful quote um, some conservative Christians said that, that, like Tim Keller said, this is really cool. This is really cool what he said. What a great you know use of his platform. Some very conservative Christians said that was gibberish. That was yeah. not a presentation of the gospel. There was no clear gospel message in there. If that's what his faith is, <laughs> then and why you know so some very conservative Christians were criticizing conservative Christians like Tim Keller for praising Stephen Colbert for talking about his faith in a way that never presented the gospel, which led Tim Keller, when, when Tim Keller has to respond to an outcry against Tim Keller, you know, that, you know, it's gotten up to a pretty high level because it seems like he could stay on above all of that. But he said, the recent post I made about Stephen Colbert's partial answer about his faith and the ensuing comments has shown me American Christians still have a long way to go on understanding Colossians 4, 5, and 6, how to be, quote, wise in the ways you act towards outsiders. This is called contextualization. So his point was that Stephen Colbert did a masterful job of contextualizing his faith so that it fit in the framework of a late night comedy talk show to all of America, uh, to which others have said, well, he had an opportunity to present the gospel and he blew it. I don't even think he's a Christian. Okay, next okay. story. No, we don't no, have no, anything no. whatsoever to say. I'm going to let Caitlin go first. Sky, go. Caitlin's going to yeah. go first. Thoughts? Um, Thoughts, Caitlin? I mean, I do think on one hand, this is just so representative of how a lot of evangelicals 
learned in youth group to think about their life outside, quote unquote, of the church, which is, I just have this very didactic way of being in the world. And any opportunity I have to just sort of go through the Romans road or be very, you know, this is the gospel in these many words. And, and to be sort of proud of how like aggressive and awkward we could be about it. Like I remember being in middle school and being like having someone in my class be surprised I was a Christian and being just like distraught about it because I thought I'm supposed to be just like as annoying as possible. Right. Like, I'm supposed to be a Jesus freak and you're <laughs> supposed, supposed to, to hate me. And <laughs> yes. And but it was never obvious because you were never supposed to be obvious because you sacrificed for other people, you took care of other people, you spent your money differently. You were supposed to be awkward and weird and different because you just kept saying the same very didactic thing over and over again. And this was such a beautiful presentation, I thought, on this clip from um, Stephen Colbert about someone who so genuinely, honestly believes what they believe, that it comes out and answers to questions in really beautiful ways. And that the the relationship between the work that he does in his faith is really real and genuine and um, thick. It's not just, yeah. oh, I'm a Christian while I'm at work. It's no, my faith really deeply informs the work that I do. And the fact that we would not celebrate that just is another example of like, the poverty of the way that we think about evangelism, the way we think about living our lives in public, the way we think about relationships, the fact that everything has to be sort of transactional. Like someone who was there asked you a question and you were supposed to not really answer it, but instead take this as an opportunity to make sure that like they believe the gospel right this minute. Like that's not how relationships work. So to me, it felt yeah. like an example, someone criticizing that could have been you know, someone in many of the youth groups that I grew up in just yeah. being like every opportunity you do it this way. There's no creativity. There's no different options. It's just this one way forward. Yeah. The way I thought about it, first of all, it's clear that he's given a lot of thought to his mm -hmm. vocation and his faith and the interaction because yeah. unless this was brilliantly edited together and somehow he, you know, cobbled that answer together with research and, and we don't know it, but it didn't seem that way. But to your point, Caitlin, um, there's a, there's a lot of Christianity, particularly in more conservative fundamentalist varieties that will not allow things to exist on more than one level. And what Stephen Colbert exhibits is a, is a mature, multifaceted understanding of his faith. For example, he talked mm -hmm. about how something can be both sad and funny at the same time and how something can be both painful and redemptive. And this is just basic Christian theology. Jesus is fully God and fully man at the same time. This is bread, but the Catholic understanding is it is somehow mysteriously also the body of Christ. And that that paradoxical understanding of reality is evident in his remarks that something I do can be funny, but also be redemptive and hopeful and, and death isn't the final thing. But in, in fundamentalist forms of Christianity, they don't allow that kind of complexity. It can only be one mm -hmm. thing at any moment. It can just be bread. It's only bread. That's all it is. Don't think about it as anything more than bread. And I think that re that re reveals why they reacted the way they did. They see that Stephen Colbert is a public figure. He's on television and someone just asked him about his faith and he didn't give the four spiritual laws. He gave a more thoughtful, nuanced, layered answer, and they don't know what to do with that. So they see him as a failure. So that's not, this isn't about just different traditions. This is about maturity and immaturity. This is about childish faith and mature faith. This is about single dimensional understanding of the world and a multi-dimensional vision of the world. And Tim Keller has a mature faith with multiple dimensions, understands contextualization, and the people who are critical have a very childish, single dimensional uh, unnuanced and fairly anemic understanding of their faith. And it saddens me because they are deprived. It's like playing around in a puddle when there's an Olympic sized swimming pool you could be playing in. And they're angry that someone else is in the pool and they're not just playing in the puddle. And that's what Colbert represented. He's, he's mm -hmm. deeply immersed in his faith and that should be celebrated, not criticized. Yeah. And he's also from an entirely different faith tradition than, you know, a Southern Baptist church planter or a Southern Baptist theologian would be in saying, if you have an opportunity to talk about your faith, what do you say? What do you say? You know, and it's, it's, I mean, if, if he was you know, Greek Orthodox or Russian Orthodox and you ask him about his faith, he's going to say something very different than a Pentecostal in America is going to say about their faith if you ask them. And that doesn't delegitimize their testimony. It just, 
it's you're you're getting exposed to different thought from a different tradition and also how someone else is contextualizing their faith into their setting and you do have to recognize that he has been on tv just about every night for the last you know 20 years if he was looking for an opportunity to present the four spiritual laws he would have done it by now but he has concluded that that is not why he's there so he's not going to do that um, so when faith does come out to criticize it, it's like, you know how hard it is to do the job he's doing in the context where he's got a, a you know, a, a network saying, here are your numbers this week, Mr. Colbert, they're down 0.2%. That, you know, represents this much money we just lost from last week. Can you do something to crank it back up? Oh, how about if I present the four spiritual laws? <laughs> is it, with that? It, anyway. I, I just yes. wanted to... To, I, I was thinking about this, and I think part of it is that it's also missing the point of asking someone for their unique perspective, because he could just give you an answer that, you know, that what they want him to say, the sport for spiritual laws, you could just Google that. Like, it's not right. a unique Colbert perspective. Right. And so, like, she's asking for his unique perspective on why he does what he does and how he does it. Right. And if he just said, oh, well, you know, these four things. It's like, well, that's that could be true for any Christian who does anything. So, you know, it just it doesn't even yeah. make sense for what she was asking. Right. right. Okay. He was a human answering another human's question. How do you yeah. get more yeah. contextual than exactly. that? Yeah. But he's supposed yeah. to be a, 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 a evangelist. And, and like any good salesman, no matter what question you're asked, you've got to turn it to answer what you want to say. Don't answer their question. Like a politician. Yeah. 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 Mm. Well, yeah. Anyone who's mm. done media training. Okay. Okay. Last story. Uh, Russell Moore. Uh, no, not Russell Moore. Sorry. David French created a bit <laughs> of a hubbub, which included Russell Moore's in the story. was mm. interviewed, quoted in the story as well. Uh, Dave, or David, not David French. Nope. nope. David Brooks. <laughs> wow. This is good. You got I'm, there. I'm doing well. David Brooks. <laughs> Um, who, who is the, what'd you say? He's this kind of the, the staff conservative at the New York times. Okay. You don't have to say anything. I'll just keep going. I'm going to say he's kind of the staff conservative at the New York times. Yes. He's a, he's a opinion writer and a conservative Yeah, at the yeah. New York times. He's the best known conservative at the yes. New York times, probably. Um, the dissenters trying to save evangelicalism from itself, a very long piece that starts out this way. Think of your 12 closest friends. These are the people you vacation with, talk about your problems with, do life with in the most intimate and meaningful ways. Now imagine if six of those people suddenly took a political or public position you found utterly vile. Now imagine learning that those six people think that your position is utterly vile. You would suddenly realize that the people you thought you knew best and cared about most had actually been total strangers all along. You'd feel disoriented, disturbed, unmoored. Your life would change. This is what has happened over the past six years to millions of American Christians, especially evangelicals. There have been three big issues that have profoundly divided them. The white evangelical embrace of Donald Trump, sex abuse scandals in evangelical churches and parachurch organizations, organizations and attitudes about race relations, especially after the killing of George Floyd. And then he quotes a whole host of people, uh, you know, including Beth Moore, uh, Russell Moore, Lecrae, Kristen Cobes Dumay, uh, Karen Swallow Pryor, just goes on and on, David French, uh, Peter Gerson, like half the people he talks about have been on the Holy Post podcast. Thank you very Pete much. Wainer. Pete Wainer. Pete um, Wainer about what's happening in evangelicalism and how, you know, and, and David French to kind of, or David Brooks to kind of pick up this flag and say, hey, there is a, a major effort. Uh, they quote Tim Dalrymple, a friend of Sky and I, who's the uh, CEO of Christianity Today, who said, uh, th I thought this was a good quote from Tim Dalrymple. As an evangelical, I've found the last five years to be shocking, disorienting, and deeply disheartening. One of the most surprising elements is that I've realized that the people who I used to stand shoulder to shoulder with on almost every issue, I now realize that we're separated by a yawning chasm of mutual incomprehension. I never would have thought that could happen, could have happened so quickly. So a lot of what we've been talking about for the past five or six years 
comes yeah. up in this article. And a lot of the people that we've been talking to in the last five or six years come up in this article. So it was interesting to see it get this level of visibility. Yeah, that was my <clears throat> my uh, hopefulness in reading the article is knowing the audience of the New York Times. It was an opportunity for them to see a sliver of evangelicalism that normally doesn't get much attention. And that there are really thoughtful, intelligent, wise godly Christian leaders that don't get represented by the the crazy uncles that are platformed everywhere. So I don't know what will come of it, but I'm grateful that that David Brooks did that profile of so many great people. Yeah. Uh, he says, amid the storm, new, co new coalitions are gradually forming across many different kinds of Christians, among those whose eyes have been opened, who are rethinking old convictions, who are meeting and mobilizing in the hopes of renewing the evangelical presence in America. Now, some people would uh, uh, negatively call this, you know, the evangelical deconstruction project of people, you know, like Kristen Kobes Dumay and Beth Allison Barr and, you know, uh, Jamar Tisby trying to pull apart the foundations of evangelicalism so that we lose the faith. You don't, both of you are shaking your head. I'm mm -mm. thinking you don't agree. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of different pieces to this, but some of the folks like, like um, Russell Moore is a great example. He hasn't shifted his position from what I can tell one inch from what it was five or 10 or 15 years ago on any of these issues. He's an outsider now because everyone else has moved in the direction of totalitarianism and Trumpism. Mm -hmm. So yeah. um, there's that dynamic going on. And then there are other people like Beth Allison Barr or Kristen Kobes Dume or others who are pointing out some of the patriarchal uh, nonsense that maybe has been a part of evangelicalism in America for a long time, but it isn't really at the heart of the gospel, the evangel that should be the heart of evangelicalism. So the, yes, there is some deconstruction and correction going on, but some of it is just simply people like Moore and David French and others who haven't changed at all. They're just not able to go along with the group that's bought into Christian nationalism. Right. Caitlin? It's weird. That I, I saw criticisms of this on both sides. Um, Al Mohler wrote a thing that was like, <laughs> just basically criticizing David Brooks for not being an evangelical, which doesn't disqualify him from writing this. It was a strange piece right. that didn't really respond to the substance of any of it. And then I saw a lot of people on Twitter who might consider themselves ex-evangelical or might have never been evangelical, who were critical of the framing of the piece as this like renewal, saving, just kind of like let the thing die. It's, mm -hmm. it's rotten to the mm -hmm. core, let it burn. And I do think there's some truth in their criticism in the sense that I don't actually think most of the people, some of the people uh, included in the article, this might be true of, but I think most of the people in that article aren't invested in the project of saving evangelicalism. I don't think they're interested in like holding on to institutions or to, first of all, I don't even know what saving evangelicalism looks like. This is an amorphous, weird thing that doesn't right. reside in one institution or statement of faith or whatever. Um, so I don't even know what that would look like. I think most of them are concerned with fixing problems in the immediate context that they're in, whether that's in Christian universities or in Christian denominations or institutions. If I care about sexual abuse in the SBC, I care about women who are being abused in the SBC. I don't care about saving evangelicalism. I don't even really care about saving the SBC. I think there are people within evangelicalism that whether they are more critical of elements of it, like people in this article, or whether they're not, are invested in sort of just like maintaining the status quo and saving broken institutions just for the sake of it. And we do need the criticisms of those of these people online who are critical of the article to remind us that there is always going to be that temptation to put your hope in a particular tradition, a particular form of the faith, and to recognize that whether it's for good reasons, like I love this denomination I grew up in, or I love this university I went to, or it's for bad reasons, I'm employed by an evangelical institution, and so I have a financial interest in it maintaining cultural power, whether it's for good or bad reasons, we have to hold all of these things pretty lightly and and keep our hands open and recognize that the spirit will move where we don't expect. And we have to kind of know that none of those institutions are the be all end. There's no existential threat to the Christian faith, even if there is an right. existential threat to a Christian university that doesn't have a budget, you know, and it can still be, those things can still be good and we can care about maintaining them for good reasons without needing to kind of think of them as existential threats. And I do think those criticisms are helpful, though I don't think, I think most of the people in that article would not consider themselves on some like, you know, 
existential threat level trying to kind of fix evangelicalism. I think they care about helping the people who are being hurt by problems that exist in evangelical institutions. Right. There's kind of a question of, of, you know, where do I want to invest my time? Is it in trying to sustain yeah. the existing institutions so that they don't look so bad and people return to them? Or is it aiding people as they, you know, jump ship to end up somewhere else healthy, to start, you know, new bodies that are healthy, new groups that are healthy. Um, and I guess it's, you know, some of that is just, is there institutional loyalty and is institutional loyalty a good thing sometimes? Well, ever? I, I do think it, it doesn't have to be loyalty to be a sense that institutions are good. Um, it could be, and, and I've seen this among people my age, where there's a there's ironically a very evangelical impulse sometimes in people who would yeah. claim they've left evangelicalism of like, I'm going to start a new thing and it's going to fix all the problems and I'm going to start a new church or a new institution mm -hmm. or whatever. And um, I, I think there can be something really good. And I think about this all the time because I'm a part of a church in Durham that is in a mainline denomination. And yet the church itself is full of a lot of evangelicals. The church itself is pretty evangelical. So they are are facing this problem on a complete opposite of where I've ever been. I'm usually like the more progressive quote unquote person in a conservative institution. A lot of them are the more conservative people in a more progressive denomination. And I think it's really important, like you were saying, to have wise people in your life that can help you think through when you stick it out and when you leave. But hopefully your motivation is not just loyalty in general to an institution, but it might be, I think it's good for churches and schools and universities and, and other kinds of institutions to exist. And if I feel called to this one, then I will try and make it the best that it can possibly be without that angst of if this thing dies, the faith dies, or I die, or my community right, dies. Right, right. How do you know when an institution might be worth reforming versus, and, and maybe it's just the amount of resistance you, you, <laughs> that the institution puts up to being reformed? Yeah, this is a, this, I don't think there's a formula for this. And a lot of it also depends on particular vocation. Like what is your calling? Some people yeah. I think yeah. are genuinely called to go down with the ship, you know, kind of fight to the end to try to salvage something. And I honor that, but there are others who, you know, they're not, they're called to jump the ship and rescue all the people who've already jumped and they're floating in the water, you know, yeah. like Leonardo DiCaprio and you don't want them to freeze to death. So you, you know, right. you help them up. Right. I saw how that ends and that's not good. No. That's so there's different good. callings. I, I don't want to prescribe one, okay. one thing for everybody. Okay. Caitlin. Caitlin, do you agree or disagree? Yeah, I do. I, I do think sometimes though when, and because people will ask me this a lot about, should I leave my church or should I stay? And and I say something similar of like, I if I was at your church or if I knew you personally, I could maybe speak into this. But if I don't, then I really can't. But I do think what people, when people ask that question, they tend to think that there are two options, which is leave and then and have no accountability or relationship or any kind of sense of of responsibility for what you've left it's just gone done or stay and keep your head down and don't say anything and don't just accept what's difficult and there's a whole range of other approaches that are good like sky was saying i do think some people are supposed to stay until they literally get pushed out or the thing dies or like they are supposed to spend that period of their life if not their whole life that way um, and that's not one of those two options. That's you're still trying to, in as wise and um, faithful of a way as you can, say the truthful thing, even when mm -hmm. it costs you. And then on the other side, it might be that you do end up leaving, but you still feel, I, I really think a lot of people who say that they've left evangelicalism, first of all, it's kind of uncertain what that means, because like we said, evangelicalism is not one thing, but mm -hmm. then kind of assume that it won't continue to affect them and are not very critical about the things that it may have formed in them that they might continue to still do or expect about the world or the kinds of other institutions they want to form will still be shaped by those things that they were shaped by. And so even if you do leave, it's not just, oh, I've left and now I'm in a different thing and it's completely different. It's, no, what new kinds of responsibilities do I have to my new community? What problems do does it have that are not the same problems? And how can I reflect on myself and how I've been shaped and make sure that I'm not kind of just reproducing the same problems in a different right. context? And so that's a range of responses. And too often, we think it's one of those two answers and it doesn't have to be that. And it is really then, it's really like dependent on every single person's vocation, context, gifts, all of those kinds of things to determine what it looks like to be faithful. And everyone wants a better answer to 
follow the leading of the Holy Spirit, listen to wise people, discern in your own life what to do. Everyone wants a formula, like Sky said, and that's it would be great if that was possible, but that also wouldn't require much faith. Yeah. I know this is probably a loaded metaphor or analogy not to do flywheels again, something like that, but I think there's <laughs> there is some interesting wisdom to get from the New Testament around the issue of divorce. And especially in Ooh. 1 Corinthians 7, where Paul's talking to what happens if you're married to a non-believer, like when is it okay to leave? And in that case, it, he, his instruction is basically stay with them if they'll have you, but if they abandon you, you're okay to leave. Mm. And it mm. feels like for some of us, there are institutions we've been a part of, and sometimes those institutions have just flat out been adulterous. They have committed themselves to something other than Christ, and we can't stick around and be a part of that. Others have just abandoned us. I think this is a little bit what Russell Moore and others have experienced, where they didn't change their position. The community they were part of abandoned them. And right. so their leaving was just an acknowledgement of what had already happened, essentially. Yeah, uh, Unfortun they filed for divorce with a spouse who'd already left them. That's kind of the idea. Unfortunately, for many Christian institutions, the single greatest asset they have, the most significant asset they have, is their donor base. Right. Whether you're a church, whether you're a you know a nonprofit publishing house, where it doesn't matter what kind of ministry you are. Generally, you think, well, it's it's our audience. Our audience, our greatest asset. No, it's your second greatest asset. Your greatest asset is your donor base. It's the people who are giving the money. So any kind of significant effort to reform or redirect an institution will bump into the will of the donor base. And if you're moving an institution too far from where the donor base currently is, there, there's nothing there to preserve. It, it will just fall. It'll, you know, it'll be like sand in your hand. It'll just fall apart. Um, so there's, you know, if you find an institution and, and, you're part of an institution or you're at a church and you, you know, you know, the people that are really keeping the church going and they see the problem that you see, you can do something there. But if you know the people that are keeping the institution going and none of them see the problem you see, in fact, they see you as the problem, you probably can't do anything there. Which, which is a sad commentary for a Christian ministry where you're basically saying the people with the money are the real shepherds. Uh-huh. Yeah. Isn't well, that how, how many how many Christian colleges at, at the end of the day, you know, we were fine with what you did, but the trustees and the alumni went nuts. Right. So But also like, do you believe in God? <laughs> What? Like I'm what so serious. What are you, so are you asking me, Caitlin? <laughs> no, I mean like to these people that are making purely financial decisions, do you believe yeah. in God? Because yes. it really it sounds so I'm I'm just really honestly sick and tired of people acting like it's idealistic and naive and youthful to just be like make decisions based on what is actually true and good. And yes, we will have disagreements about that. And yes, people don't always know it. But I have been in so many situations where people made clear to me that they knew what the right thing to do was. And they said, oh, I'm so sorry, but these constraints are in place. And, and they were always financial constraints. Yeah. And for Christian universities and seminaries and institutions and for churches to act that way is to be an atheist. It's to like ignore the fact that God is real and works and to only look at material issues in your life and make decisions based off of that. And I, I really just wish we took that more seriously. Well, I, to your point, I've been in the room. I've been in the room with evangelical leaders who say, this is the right thing to do, but we will not do it because it's going to impact our donors or our members or whatever their constituency is. And and what they're essentially saying is, we will not sacrifice, we will not risk the perpetuation of our institution. Mm -hmm. And yet here we are Christians who proclaim a message that says, we believe in one who is so committed to the will of God that he was willing to die to do what the Father called him to do. And because of his faithfulness, the Lord raised him up and gave him a name above all names, right? We believe in sacrifice and resurrection. And yet so many evangelical leaders won't trust God with their institutions. Mm -hmm. They won't mm -hmm. let them potentially yeah. die to do the right thing. And that is a betrayal of the faith. Sure, Jesus was willing to die for, for what was right. But was he willing to sacrifice his 501c3 nonprofit? See. You didn't really address that at all. So, uh, so I found the, I got to wrap this up. I found the 
David, not David French, David Brooks article mm-hmm. in the New York Times, which you should all look up. We'll put it in the show notes so you can link to it. Uh, it might be behind a paywall. I don't know, but surely you can find it somewhere. I found it encouraging at the amount, at least of, of light being uh, shined, shown, shunned onto the, the movement within evangelicalism to say, hey, uh, we're off the rails here. I found it encouraging. Yes? Yeah. yeah. Totally. Okay. Jason? Yeah. <laughs> Were you Jason muted? Jason is equally yes. encouraged. Okay. <laughs> yes. Okay. And we'll see what happens next. I, I already saw somebody, a, um, a theologian from a Southern Baptist seminary tweet on Sunday, well, I am on the way to go to church with a whole bunch of evangelicals that do not know that their movement is in shambles and they're just doing the good work of feeding the poor and helping the homeless and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They didn't get the memo that their movement is in shambles. I hope they are doing that. Yeah, Yeah. I know. Me too. Me too. But you also might want to look up and out. Check your memos. Thanks, everybody, for listening. We got a good guest. It's going to be great. Uh, Stay tuned. For those of you that support us on Patreon, we really appreciate it. You're helping us keep the lights on and uh, dream some fun ideas for going forward that you'll hear about (gasps) sooner or later. Uh, Thanks, Caitlin, for stopping by. Thanks, Guy. Thanks, Jason. Go have a cinnamon roll on us. We'll pay for it with the institutional donors. And we'll see you next week. Bye. There's a major fight happening in our country right now over the future of our democracy. A shocking percentage of Republicans believe the 2020 election was stolen, and a growing number of Democrats believe the right of minorities to vote is in real danger. While there are fights about access and outcomes of elections, most Americans still believe in democracy itself. According to my guest today, we probably have more faith in democracy than America's founders did. Tracy McKenzie is a history professor at Wheaton College and the author of We the Fallen People, The Founders and the Future of American Democracy. He explains how the founders created a system of government based on the depravity of the American people, not our virtue, and how they feared democracy and actually tried to limit what they called the tyranny of the majority. McKenzie also explains how we lost this perspective to embrace democracy as a kind of false gospel, which says the American people are inherently good and that there's no problem which more democracy can't fix. If you like history, politics, and theology, you're going to love this conversation. And if you're a Patreon supporter of The Holy Post, there's a fantastic bonus interview exclusively for you where Dr. McKenzie explains why the founders limited access to the ballot to only white land-owning men. The answer is more complicated than you realize and might surprise you. Here is my conversation with Robert Tracy McKenzie. Tracy McKenzie, welcome to The Holy Post. It is. My pleasure to be with you, Sky. I've been looking forward to this. Uh, me too. I, I told you before we recorded that I thoroughly enjoyed this book. I loved reading it. I was a history major as an undergrad, not at Wheaton, not at Wheaton, but I still love reading history. And I, it, you've written a fantastic book here about details in American history that I knew pieces of, but you put it together in a super helpful way. Um So let's begin here with just a definition. You speak frequently throughout the book about what you refer to as the democratic gospel or democratic faith. Can you define that as we get started? Because it's a major theme that we need to understand. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it sort of rests on the premise that the way that we discuss politics carries uh, messages often that are embedded that we're not even aware of them. Uh, And one of them is what I call the democratic gospel. And this is really just speaking about human nature. Uh, The prevailing uh, relentless message of our democratic culture is that human nature is is basically good. So that's what I call the democratic gospel, the message that we are individually good. Uh, The democratic faith is a a slightly different uh, concept. And that has to do with really the collective implications of our individual, you know, positive human nature. Uh, democratic faith says that uh, the majority decision will reliably, not always, but reliably deliver uh, just outcomes. Uh, so the idea is of, of having faith in a particular kind of system uh, to create the kind of society that we uh, believe is just. Yeah. And you mentioned in the book, we'll get into this as we get into the Jacksonian stuff, but many of us hold this assumption that any of the problems that we may be having as a society 
will be solved with just more democracy. And Absolutely. yeah, it, it's, it is a blind faith that this is kind of a God ordained way of solving the world's problems. And you point out the fact that that's democracy, like any other system has its flaws and a blind faith in it is kind of dangerous. Uh, it's exactly right. I mean, one of the things I'm trying to do in the book is to challenge us uh, to dig deeper into our uh, values, to figure out what our bedrock commitments are, uh, and then use those um, as a kind of um, benchmark against which to measure democracy. Not only do we tend to have blind faith in democracy, but I would just argue uh, that it really is circular reasoning. If, if we say, well, the only problem with our democracy is it needs to be more democratic, we're not really defining any terms. We're just uh, equ equating democracy with the good society, whatever that means. Uh, and so I, I think in order to think more deeply, in order to think more Christianly, we really have to jettison this uh, sort of blind faith in democracy. Yeah. And you really see it existing on both sides of the political spectrum, depending on when you look at it. What comes to mind is back after 9-11, when George W. Bush was president, he used this democratic gospel to justify what we did in Afghanistan and the invasion of Iraq, this belief that if we just get rid of these tyrants or these regimes and put in a democratic system, it'll bring goodness and flourishing to the Middle East. And and then under the Obama administration during the Arab Spring, where you had these revolts against um, more dictatorial systems in Tunisia and Egypt and elsewhere in Syria, there was also an affirmation that, well, if we just create democracies there, it'll go great. But you know, you see the Muslim Brotherhood get elected in Egypt, or you see Hamas get elected in, in, in Palestine, and you see, you know, craziness erupt in Iraq. So it kind of revealed that this blind faith in democracy is kind of universal in America right now, and it doesn't always work out well, especially in our foreign policy. Well, it, it, it is a kind of cultural constant. And, you know, one of the reasons I wrote the book was just to take us sort of out of our particular moment in time so that we could see our particular moment in time uh, more clearly. Because you're exactly right, Sky. Th it, this is not uh, partisan specific. It characterizes both sides of the aisle, you know, the whole political continuum. We debate over what a truly democratic society, what the details of a truly democratic society would be, but we don't question whether a truly democratic society would be truly just. That's just an unchallenged assumption, uh, I think, on both sides. That's right. Okay, so let's let's get into the first section of the book because I think this is the part that a lot of our audience would be pretty shocked by. And that is where you unpack what did the founders really think about democracy and what did they think about human nature and how then did that translate into the system they created in the constitution. Um I appreciate the fact that you don't really you're not bothered by the question of were the founders Christians? You are more interested in asking, were their ideas consistent with a Christian view of humanity? And um, explain, summarize, it's, it's unfair to ask you just because it's what you wrote the whole book on, but begin to summarize where we have gotten off track about what the founders actually thought about humanity and Americans in particular. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I'd love to talk about that. L let's let's just start with what the framers generally thought. Their their understanding of human nature was was complicated. They they actually um, my, my students often hear what I um, uh, argue before them, and they think, oh well, the framers' view of human nature was that we're all evil. They, they would never have said that. It was much more complicated than that. They believed that we were capable of um, acts of great courage or compassion or self sacrifice, but they said universally, our default is self-interest. Uh, that's what is typically uh, in the in the driver's seat. So that understanding that men and women uh, are self-interested really drives their political philosophy. It informs every line of the of the Constitution. The whole um, system of checks and balances, the various ways of limiting the government really only makes sense when we understand that they believe that because we're sort of in, uh, innately selfish and self-seeking, that anyone who has power will be prone to abuse it. Uh, and so you just got to be fearful of power, whether it's exercised by uh, a single figure or a democratically elected majority. Uh, and so that's their assumption. I don't argue that that's uh, all driven by religious convictions, because I just don't think you can prove that one way yeah. or the other. But I do think we can ask the question, is it consistent with 
uh, what the church has argued and taught for for centuries? And there, I think the answer is is absolutely so. So, so that would be a broad generalization about the generation uh, of the um, late 18th century. One of the things I'll I argue in the book and I delight in sort of arguing uh, is that we got off the rails really quickly. You know, yeah. I, I think sometimes we can be tempted to say, you know, anything that's gone wrong with America must have happened uh, since the last election or it's happened in the last generation or it's happened since the Beatles came to America in my generation and everything began to fall apart. Uh, but I argue that within, oh, certainly two generations of the of the founding, the overwhelming uh, dominant uh, sort of narrative in American politics uh, is that we're basically good uh, and that democracy is innately just. Yeah. And we'll, we're going to get to that in a, in a minute, which is the middle section of your book where you talk about the breakdown of this original founder's uh, view of humanity. But um, to, to deconstruct this mythology that we've built backwards into our founders, many of us carry this assumption or have been taught to think that the founders created a democracy because they didn't believe in monarchy and the tyrants of monarchy, but had great faith in the virtue and uh, inherent goodness of the American people. And I want to read a quote. This is from page 35 of your book, where you reveal how this manifests itself today, even within Christian circles. You write this, in making a case for moral reform in our own day, well-meaning Christian writers often tell the story of the United States as a story of decline from a time when Americans were characterized by a civic-minded commitment to the common good. Eric Metaxas, for example, writes that it was because of this once widespread quality that the framers of the Constitution could place, quote, tremendous trust in the people, end quote. Bemoaning the individualism and selfishness rampant today, Metaxas exhorts us to become again, quote, the America we were at first, end quote. This would have bewildered the founders. I mean, this is the mantra of the political right, make America great again. And you can put the point on the timeline wherever you thought America was great again. But there's this assumption that in the past, America was great, perhaps no greater than at its founding. And we've lost some of our virtue and greatness. Um, Describe a little bit why the founders even believed the Constitution was necessary and why they thought the Articles of Confederation that came before it had failed. Did the founders believe in the inherent virtue of the American people compared to others? Uh, the, the short answer is they did not at all. I, I mean, one of the things that uh, I was so struck by in reading, you know, hundreds and hundreds of pages of their uh, correspondence uh, is, is that they're repeatedly saying that Americans aren't exceptional, uh, that there's nothing unique about um, human nature uh, in the United States. Uh, they're saying the reason that the Articles of Confederation had failed uh, is that uh, the framers of that uh, blueprint for government had thought too highly of human nature. They, they had thought that people would promote the general welfare without being sort of constrained to do so, that they would, uh, of their own volition, seek the welfare of others. And they decided that just wasn't true, that the message of the Articles is that people don't self-sacrifice very often uh, for uh, the public good. Uh, and and so they would have said, as George Washington uh, put it, we must take human nature as we find it. So actually, a lot of what they're saying during the uh, years leading up to the Constitutional Convention, during the ratification debates that followed, they're saying that uh, there's really a crisis of virtue, that virtue is is really very scarce uh, and that uh, to make a, a system of self-government work you had to take that into consideration. You could not assume that people would really sort of go against their nature. Yeah. Let, let me pull up a few quotes from the book that you cite from the founders. George Washington in 1786 said that personal rather than national interests have become the great object of attention. Uh, he also said, we have probably had too good an opinion of human nature in forming our confederation. <laughs> that's not that's not too uh, great an endorsement of our people. And then Hamilton, who's you know, had a resurgence of popularity in recent years because of the musical, uh, said, we have no reason to think ourselves wiser or better than other men. Um, yeah. And he, he goes on to talk about some of the less appealing aspects of, of, of American society at the time. So we've romanticized this idea that in the past we were this virtuous, religious, moral, upstanding, godly people who could be entrusted with democracy, but somehow we've lost it. But you're saying what history really shows is we were just as messed up at the beginning 
as we are today. And the founders took that into consideration in creating the system that they created. Is that fair? Uh, yeah, I think that's a fair statement. I, I, if anything, if I would say uh, there was an advantage that the the founders had over us is that is that they thought the key uh, to a just society was sort of starting by acknowledging that we don't have a, a intrinsic tendency for justice. Yeah, uh, and and so that kind of skepticism. They weren't cynical, but a kind of skepticism of human nature. Uh, they would have thought was the first step toward a successful experiment in self-government. Uh, so it was the idea, the recognition that we are not good, uh, that was the advantage that they s- sort of have over us. Yeah. And today you hear so much about, especially at least in my experience from the right, so much about American exceptionalism, that we are this, we're different than other people. We're more virtuous than other people as a country in, in our history. And the founders would have been the first to say, no, 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 we are not different, which is why we're creating a system that recognizes the fallibility and and depravity, frankly, of a lot of humanity. Okay, obviously the founders were not fans of monarchy since they rebelled against the monarch in England, Um, but they also wrote a lot about their fear of democracy and the fear of the way majority rule could become a form of tyranny. Can you share a little bit about that concern and how they created a system to try to mitigate against the the shadow side of democratic systems? That's a fantastic question. And it it just takes us back to the, to the complexity of, of this understanding uh, of their understanding of human nature and how it related to the structure of government. The, the framers of the constitution all would have agreed that the majority must ultimately rule that they would have said that um, if you're living in a society where the will of the majority is constantly thwarted, you're not living in a free society. So they actually hold two things simultaneously in tension. One is the belief that the majority must rule. The second is the belief that because we're selfish by nature, uh, the majority will not always be just. Uh, And so that's why they actually build into the structure of the Constitution a lot of of ways really to sort of slow down uh, the expression of majority will, to sort of um, not permanently thwart it, but certainly slow it down. One of the terms that they use a lot uh, in describing our nature is, is passion, that we often respond emotionally and often ir- even irrationally to circumstances. And just by slowing down that process of government, you might at least mitigate the potential damage that that might, that might, might cause. So th- their, their view really says the majority must rule and the majority will not always be just. And so we have to uh, always c- keep that in mind. Yeah. And some of us, when we think back to our middle school, high school, <laughs> Uh, American history classes will recall the term checks and balances, right? That they they put checks and balances into the system of government in order to make sure that no one or one party or one group or one branch got too much power that could lead to tyranny. Um, so yeah, you you see that distrust of of human nature embedded in the system, and even a distrust of what the majority could do if it had too much power. Okay, now let's let's talk about the middle section of the book, what you call the Great Reversal. How and when did we begin to lose this understanding of human nature and really just completely give ourselves to this gospel of democracy that uh, we still are with today? How did that change occur? That's a great question, Sky, and I'm not even sure that I could explain such a phenomenon like this as much as I can describe it. I, I think, you know, I think we can pinpoint it more or less to the uh, very close of the 18th century and the first generation of the 19th century, so that by um, the 1820s or so, it's becoming very common, at least in political conversations, uh, to speak in terms of this democratic gospel uh, and democratic faith. Uh, I, I think there's lots of things going on that help to explain it. I think part of it actually is changes in American churches, uh, mm. which are becoming more democratic themselves, both in the way that they're governed and also in the way that they talk about human nature. In fact, one of the big questions you could ask about this period is just whether the church is um, leading the way and American politics is is conforming to theological changes or vice versa, that the church is sort of changing its theology to keep up with a more democratic public life. And I, I can't say that it's one uh, or the other. The same but is true today. It still feels like a chicken and egg. It's a constant. Yeah. You're exactly right. 
You're exactly right. But so what, whatever the order of causation, uh, by the 1820s on into the 1830s, you're, you're hearing journalists uh, say that it is insulting and absurd to question human, uh, human nature. You're h- hearing scholars say literally that the voice of the people is the voice of God. Uh, and you're having politicians uh, really fall into these uh, patterns, praising the virtue of the people, saying the people are incorruptible. As long as the people have their way, we'll never uh, go astray. It's just the new, it's the new gospel. So one of the things you you cite in here is changes in election laws and and procedures that happened by within a generation or two of the founders, whereas the the Constitution itself had um, a lot of barriers between the democratic will of the people and what actually got put in place in the government, things like the Electoral College, the... um, states didn't all have popular votes to determine who the electors were. Explain some of the changes that happened by the time of Andrew Jackson that led to a more democratic society and a higher view of democracy. So at the time that the Constitution is created, um, it would have been pretty standard in all of the states to have really severe restrictions on the franchise, on who can vote. So we, we would all expect that it's limited to males. It's limited to white males typically, but it's also limited to white male property holders. So that, um, say, when the Constitution is created, probably, this is a rough generalization, somewhere between 30 and 40 percent of white adult males are not allowed to vote. Uh, and this, has been the, this had been the pattern for centuries. There, there was no assumption that voting was a kind of natural right. Uh, but that begins to change. Uh, w- the first step is that gradually, it doesn't happen all at once, but gradually states begin to change uh, their restrictions on the franchise. They don't eliminate the property requirement immediately. They just begin to reduce it. And so uh, over time, let's say over a half century, instead of 40 percent of adult males being disfranchised, it's more like five to 10 percent so that you have almost universal white male suffrage. Uh, And as you have sort of abandoned this idea uh, that voting is not a right, as you begin to say that it is a right that that certain individuals should have. Uh, then it becomes all the more uh, common to defend that uh, on the grounds of the virtue of those who exercise it. I mean, why would you say that unvirtuous people have an absolute right to uh, shape public policy? Uh, I I think a lot of what's going on is depending on the circumstance uh, as the party in power, the state level sort of sees which way uh, the electorate is leaning. Uh, They'll relax restrictions on the franchise if they think they're going to pick up votes. Right. Uh, and over time, it's just a process repeated uh, over and over again until it becomes the national norm. So at, at the founding generation, there was a sense of uh, the vote should only be granted to those who are essentially elites. And by the time of Jackson in the 1820s, 1830s, there's broad uh, suffrage of, of white men, which means it isn't just the elites who are voting anymore. It's the average white Joe, essentially, is also voting, which changes our politics dramatically and gives rise to Andrew Jackson and populism. Um, he's a very colorful figure, and you didn't even share some of the most colorful parts of his story, which are outrageous. But anybody who reads this book is going to be pretty struck by the similarities in rhetoric and even policy between Andrew Jackson and Donald Trump. Uh can you outline just some of the qualities that Jackson foreshadowed that we've seen in recent years in our in our own time? You know, the list is so long, it's even hard to narrow it down. Uh, both would be, in, in a certain sense, political outsiders or certainly wishing to present themselves as outsiders. Uh, they're establishing their really sort of their qualifications for leadership based on things that they have done that have nothing to do with governance at all. So in, in Jackson's case, it's leading um, a military force uh, successfully. And I would even argue the 19th century that that um, m- military experience was sort of the analog to today's business experience. Yeah. We think of it as very practical, involving large numbers of individuals accomplishing uh, practical tasks. So that's part of it. Both of them, I would argue, certainly we can say this about Jackson, uh, really chafed against authority, were authoritarian themselves, but uh, really disliked being constrained by uh, governmental um, strictures of, of any kind. Uh, Jackson, we often think of as the first American populist president, use that term a minute ago, Sky. Uh, and I would argue that 
as have many, that, that Trump is, is sort of our most recent, maybe only our second truly populist uh, individual in the White House. And what that means is that they're both telling really similar stories. Uh, they're saying that the people as a whole are very good, that there is a small group of individuals who are really enemies of the people, uh, that in this moment of great crisis, what is needed is a strong leader who will be the people's defender. Uh, and uh, both of them really sort of went out of their way to increase not just dissatisfaction and delusionment, but really distrust with government. So, so Jackson is telling individuals in the 1830s that uh, the largest corporation of his day is basically buying up all of Congress. And, and he's really the one person that the people can trust to defend their uh, their interests. Yeah, so it's I alone less that he's promoting as, movement as much as he's promoting his own uh, position of authority. Yeah, I, as Trump said, I alone can fix it, um, which Jackson had, you know, said th- that kind of reverberated through history and got picked up by by Trump. Um, some of the other things that caught me were you have a, a lengthy chapter about the Trail of Tears and the removal of the Cherokee in particular, but uh, Native peoples from the eastern half of the country to move them west of the Mississippi that Jackson spearheaded. And it was pretty apparent that he ran on a, essentially a racist policy of wanting to acquire these lands for white Americans by removing the natives. Um, and it, it sort of it had echoes to me of, of build the wall kind of rhetoric that Trump used. And on top of that, Jackson was very savvy at using allies in the media to really stoke up fears and paranoia in the people to win support. Um, how did how did Jackson, two generations removed from the founders, um, epitomize what the founders had warned us about when it comes to unchecked democracy? Yeah, it's, it's just a great question. And, and I don't know that I can totally explain it, but you're right that uh, the framers would have described a Jackson-like figure as a real danger. Uh, the term that they would have most commonly used was a demagogue, someone who is building up uh, a mass following, but largely is unprincipled uh, themselves. Right. Uh, and and I, I think there is some uh, argument that, that Jackson fits that mold. Certainly, I think the framers would have seen him uh, in that way. Uh, what, what Jackson, though, is, is saying to people... I want to stress this only makes sense when uh, we believe that Americans now have come to see themselves as basically good. Uh, And actually, one of the warnings, I think, in the book is that when we see ourselves as basically good, it actually can make us more susceptible to authoritarian leaders if we can be convinced that that leader is on our side, is sort of fighting for us. Uh, And we don't worry about the concentration of power because we're pretty sure that that someone like us would use that power, you know, uh, justly. And Jackson certainly does. One of the things that has so struck me in studying him is I've never come across a single instance when he admitted to a moral failure. Uh, he, he's always right. And anyone who disagrees with him is always doing so for some sort of nefarious reasons. There's no such thing as a principled opponent. Right. Uh, and I think there's a little resonance with more recent uh, patterns as well there. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, it's striking. I mean, you can see sort of the, the imprint of narcissism through the ages, that certain personality types uh, can do no wrong, admit no uh, failure. Everyone who's against them is a monster and has some kind of demonic or evil intent. Um, your follower, The followers of this leader can do no wrong. The enemies can do no right. It's a very black and white vision of the world. But you're, you're right. When Once people believe that we are inherently good, then anything we choose or any leader we choose must also be inherently good. In our final few minutes, I want to talk about the end of your book. You uh, restrain yourself remarkably throughout the book as a historian trying to document and cite these different parts of American history and in in the founder's view of democracy. And when I, Toward the end of the book, though, uh, you admittedly take off your historian hat a little bit and open up a little bit about your own concerns about where we are as a Christian and offer um, not political or even um, structural solutions to some of the challenges we're facing today, but more in a way spiritual. Um, so let's talk about that a little bit. One of the things you you are greatly concerned about is the melding of Christianity with partisanship. Explain why that's such a problem given our history and given what the founders warned us about. 
Well, uh, it's a great question. I, I actually would, would start with, with Tocqueville. Uh, you know, whether Tocqueville was a Christian or not, he thought that, that Christianity played an important role in self-government. Uh, and he, he looked back at the history of the French Revolution. One of the first things that uh, advocates of democracy in France had done is says, we have to destroy the church. Uh, and that is because the, uh, the monarchy had been so closely allied uh, with the Catholic Church, this real close intersection between the political and religious uh, institutions of the day. And when he came to the United States, he worried. He worried that he was seeing, even two centuries ago, the beginnings of that. And he said, the danger here uh, is that we choose allies, uh, not because of love, but because of interest. Uh, and that if we're not careful, as he puts it, we lash ourselves to a cadaver, uh, meaning we lash the church to a dying or decaying institution. Right. And, and so my, my fear, and, and he would put this uh, eventually, uh, if we think about American evangelicals, um, a, a lot of the political passions that uh, are swirling today uh, are are convincing individuals that they should be opposed to uh, Christianity for reasons having nothing to do with the message of the gospel and everything to do with the political alliances right. uh, that we're entering into. So that's what makes me most fearful is that uh, we're, we're actually uh, undermining systematically the testimony of the church, believing that we are in some sense uh, advocating a, a righteous cause. Similar to that, I think some of the appeal that Donald Trump had for some Christians was a sense of, if we have a strong man in the White House, then he can unilaterally push through the things that we believe in. And one of the other warnings you give towards the end of the book is the need to push back against an imperial presidency. And this is not partisan again. It's not something that only the conservatives are pushing for. We can even see this in some liberal cases. But over the years, the presidency has gained more and more and more power as the legislature, as Congress, seems to be more dysfunctional and just surrendered its power increasingly. Why is that such a problem? If the president is able to be more effective, why don't we just endorse that kind of model? Um, and when the Congress does look like a, a, you know, a, a circus of clowns, why would we want that strengthened? Uh, well, it all goes back, I guess, into whether uh, what we think about human nature. And if we think people are basically good, there's no particular reason to uh, uh, oppose that. But if we take what uh, I would argue uh, scripture is revealed to us seriously about human nature and what the founders thought about human nature, uh, then we have to believe that that concentration of power is always a danger. Uh, and the, the pattern that we see, unfortunately, uh, is that almost no one is willing to oppose a powerful executive when that executive is part of your party. Yes. Uh, we, we very quickly uh, will cry a tyranny when it's the other side, but, but very few principled stands uh, to restrain the concentration of power whom we think we will benefit. Uh, that's another sort of aspect of what Tofel called about is our kind of uh, love for present pleasure, as he put it. I mean, we, we really are willing to swap short-term gains for long-term disaster. If you look at opinion polls today, there are several national and international uh, organizations that have done surveys that basically ask individuals if they would find a strong individual not restrained by an elected legislature and a desirable uh, figure. And it depends on the poll, but a quarter to a third of American respondents say that a powerful figure that doesn't have to be accountable to any other form of government actually might be a pretty good thing. And that should scare us all because what's that, what, what that is describing is a dictatorship. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's just, it's, it's sobering how, how easily we're willing to convince ourselves that that would be acceptable uh, as long as it's one of our guys uh, who's wielding that power. Yeah. I, that's, it's pretty early in your book where you cite that. And it's, it is frightening to think that up to a third of Americans are in favor of a dictatorship. That is really frightening. Um, yeah. And when you look at the other factors that are going on in our society, that, that should give us pause. Um, I could spend another hour talking to you about this book. I thoroughly loved it. I cannot recommend it enough to our audience to understand the history and how we've gotten to where we are. And, and to hear the warnings throughout history from the founders, from Tocqueville, from others, that democracy is fragile and systems can do some good in protecting the integrity of a, of a righteous democracy, but ultimately 
there's a lot that we need to be looking at here and and um, be careful with. So, um, Tracy, thank you so much for writing this, for your conversation around it, for for um, even venturing beyond the realm of historian to talk more about what the church's responsibility is in this moment. I, I think people will find the book really stimulating. Would you be willing to stick around for about 10 or 15 extra minutes and do a bonus conversation with me about uh, voting in the early Republic? And I, there's this little section in there where you talk about why the founders didn't want to enfranchise non-white landowners, women, and certainly slaves. I think it was really interesting. And I'd love to, for our Patreon audience to be able to hear some of that explanation. Um, so can you stick around and talk about that? I'd be glad to. Okay. Well, for everyone else, th- thank you for the book. Thank you for the conversation. Go check it out. The book is called We the Fallen People, The Founders and the Future of American Democracy. The Holy Post Podcast is a production of Holy Post Media. Production assistance by Julie Betcher. Editing by Jason Rugg. Help us create more thoughtful Christian media by supporting us at patreon.com forward slash holy post. Also, be sure to leave a review on iTunes so more people can discover thoughtful Christian content commentary, plus ukulele, and occasional butt news. Visit HolyPost.com for show notes, news stories, Holy Post merchandise, and much more.